whole workarounds with Mari. So they're still trying to figure out why Mari is doing what it's doing. So as a uh, bandage, until we get it fixed, in your shortcut menus on the bottom, there's a shortcut to install the latest version of Mari. Okay? So if you go there and you click on that, you'll have to do this like every time you want to use Mari or every day when you come in that you want to use Mari. It'll start up a uh, installer. You just walk yourself through this. I'm sure you've installed programs before. And yes. Terms of use. Yeah. Um, and then you just install it. If it says to reboot, don't reboot. Just open up Mari and you should be good. Um, with the Mari, with what I'm finding is if you have more than uh, Mari open, it will kind of crap out. Okay. So like right now, if I were to open Mari, it'll most likely crash. If I open up Photoshop and Mari, it'll most likely crash Mari. So um, when you use it, shut everything down. Just don't use any program. Just open up Mari on its own and then use Mari. And then when you're done, save it, close it, and then open up Photoshop or After Effects or whatever program you're going into. All right. <clears throat> um, so that's just the patch in the meantime until we get to the point of finding a, a permanent solution. Now, if it, um, I played with it for an hour this morning and was able, unable to get it to crash in that hour, okay? So in the hour that I used it, because I have the latest one up here, in that hour that I used it, it would lock up. Like it would, I would paint a stroke, I would hit Alt, and it would load the thing or try to uh, write the texture out, and then it would always come back. So even though it may seem like it's crashing, sometimes it's just thinking a little bit harder, okay? So we'll just keep at it, and then hopefully we'll find a solution. All right, so for our next assignment, what we're going to be doing is <clears throat> an environment. And so, um, 3D environment. Oops. All right, so <clears throat> we're building a 3D environment. Now, we don't have the time allotment to build something enormous, okay? So we're basically going to be building a corner. That's what we're going to be focusing on. So your research for this is going to be um, going out and just finding lots of pictures of the kind of environment that you want to create. So something like this is actually pretty effective in creating an environment because it's a lot of very simple stuff um, and a lot of it is staging. And what makes it actually look kind of neat is actually how they put it together. It's not like they are trying to bring you into the um, into the piece so that you're standing on the front porch or standing in the in the street looking at the house. What you're doing is they're saying this is CG. Just look at the house. Look at it as a CG house. And you can see all the cool stuff that they've done to this. Um, and it's on Pinterest. I don't think we've talked about Pinterest before, but Pinterest is a really cool way to save all of your bookmarks. So if you find images on the web and you're like, oh, I want to save it, instead of bookmarking it, which is locked to your computer, you can Pinterest it, meaning that you click the little heart and it goes to your Pinterest page, and then you basically have a bulletin board of all the stuff that you pinned and can get back to uh, where you found that stuff. Nope. <clears throat> so then you could you know allow this yes and it'll actually take you to the website of where you found that image if you click on the right spot there it goes so this is someone's uh, artwork I closed it from DeviantArt and you can browse other people's stuff <clears throat> it's a good way to connect too because if you find something like photography there's walls and billboards and, and Pinterest boards of different kinds of photography out there. So just really cool stuff, um, all right? So the way that we're gonna start this is obviously you have to have a plan of what you want to build, okay? So your plan's gonna start with, with just this. This is where you're gonna start with. So I started with a cube and I just deleted the top and the front face. That's your world, okay? That's what we're going to populate. And we're not going to build it as like an entire 
city street, you're focusing on like one building, okay, or maybe two buildings inside here, or two fronts of buildings. So you see, I just have some basic placeholders. Um, I have a door, I have a window, <clears throat> I have some, this is obviously not finished stuff, this is just placeholder stuff, just to get an idea of staging for what I want to create, okay? So these are all just props that I've kind of added into the scene just to get an idea of what the scene is supposed to look like, what I want it to look like. So as I start adding stuff into the scene, like I want a sign over this. Okay, so this is like a nightclub. Oops. And I want to have a sign over here. I'm just creating a cube and just pulling it out. You know, how big do I want this sign to be? That's what's going to help me lay this out. It's kind of like before you go into design, you're laying out just shapes, right? You're laying out squares and circles and where you're going to put the text, where you can put the pictures. That's essentially what we're doing here. Because I may look at this and say, you know what, I don't like the way that sign's placed. Maybe I want to rotate it like this. That might be a little bit nicer to look at, especially if we're just kind of showing this from a certain angle. Now we can see the name of this club or whatever it is. <clears throat> because I have this window here, I also have to keep in mind that what kind of window is that going to be? Am I going to see through the window? If I am, I have to make something on the other side so I can actually see what's going on. Okay, So it's, it's a very good idea to plan your stuff out before you get into the dirty stuff. So this kind of stage here will be basically just a few minutes. like. 20 minutes at the most just to kind of lay out what you want um, you can use these kind of resources like going to Google searching up 3d environments or searching up environments is a good idea if you have a specific spot in mind um, let's say New York nightclub oops So the spotted pig, I don't know if that's a nightclub. <laughs> so what we can do is drop the little dude from Google Maps right there. Mm -hmm. And then this is like the best reference, you know, this gives you the ability to see exactly what's on the street. Like if you're not sure what's in front of a store building, look at this, they have a plant right here, they have some windows, nice way to kind of cut it out and let you see it a little bit different. So I may want to do that. I may come to this and say, I don't want this to be flat because it's kind of boring. I want this to be a little bit more out. You know, I'm going to have basically all this dead space here. Let me pull all of this. Not that. Pull all of this forward. Like that. And then I'm just going to insert some edge loops. I'm going to grab these, I'm going to extrude them, and just pull them back. I'm going to grab oops, undo it, there we go. I'm going to extrude all of these and pull back, like that, and then I can grab these two and extrude them and pull them straight up. And then maybe I'll go through with my whoops, edge loop here, edge loop there. All right, <clears throat> I'm going to use a different tool. So uh, one of the things you may run into when you're using anything, you're modeling stuff, is tools. What tool should I use? So um, back to object mode. So multi-cut is gr or insert edge loop is great because it allows me to insert an edge loop around here. But when I'm trying to level off both of these and make sure that they're even, it's not a great tool, okay? I can still use it because I can still grab both of these, go to scale, and then scale it like that, and now they're both even. But I may want to do it a different way. There we go. So I'm gonna go to my front view. I'm gonna use the multi-cut, and the multi-cut is pretty versatile. We may have used this before when you just click. So if I click here, and click there and click here, I can add just individual points wherever I need them. But it's a multi-cut, so it allows us to do other stuff. 
Here I can click and drag, and if I hold shift, it goes straight, and you can see how it just cuts straight across, okay? So the multi-cut is neat because it allows me just to basically draw a line, and it'll cut straight through an object. So then I could go into this face and this face, and I can use bridge. There we go, so I've connected those. And then I can go into this edge and this edge, and I can scale these apart. And then maybe I want this a little bit lower, so I'm going to grab my vertices and pull it down. Now obviously my door doesn't make sense here, so let me just push that back. There we go, I'll push this back too, push my sign back. Okay, so you get the idea here that before we go into any major detail, we really want to investigate what the shapes of this are. What does the outline look like? What does the rough, the sketch look like, okay? And for stuff like this, it really gives you an idea of where you're gonna need to add more detail, where you can get away with not having as much detail, um, and then anything else that may pop up along the way, just kind of like planning stages, right? So I may say, yeah, this looks cool the way this is, but you know, how am I going to shoot this because I have you know too much stuff in my scene? Okay, so maybe this bench needs to come down more. Maybe I need to add something over here because it looks too empty, right? Maybe this is where I have just like one of those box plants or something. Maybe I'll put another box plant on this side next to the garbage, so it looks nicer. Uh, maybe I need something right here. So what should I put there? Then I can go to my images. <clears throat> and I can see what other people are doing. And then I also have to think about what kind of story I'm telling too. Because there's a lot of stuff that we can try to tell with this. There we go. And different things maybe we didn't think to put in there. Like these black things right here. Probably dumpsters with locks on them. So people don't dump. Oh, cones. That might be kind of a neat thing to put in there too, right? Mm -hmm. So if this is a nightclub, maybe I want to put some cones in the street so that nobody parks in the street. Like parks right in front of there. Right. So we'll drop a couple cones in here. And again, you're not modeling stuff in this stage. We're just placing things. We're just getting us an idea of what is in the scene. That's all we're doing. So something like that is sufficient for a cone until we model one. I'll throw one on that side too, just to kind of even it out. There we go. Okay, and that's what we're doing. We're just looking through and seeing what we want to put inside of our scene. Let's pretend we want to add a tree to our scene. What's that? That's a tree. Now let's say we want to add a tree to our scene. We'd obviously have to know how do we get a tree inside of Maya. Do we model the trunk? Do we model the leaves? How does that work? It depends on how you want to do it. If you want to bring your picture, you bring the RPG, <clears throat> take the picture and bring it in. Right. We could take a picture and bring it in, but then we have to consider a tree is going to be right in front of us. So we're going to right away tell it's fake, right? Uh, what if we want to light it differently? Then we have to look at that too, because maybe, maybe this is the night scene because it's a nightclub, right? So it's a night scene in a nightclub. So I want to have this as something I can light. So um, let's see, if I go to general editors, where do they move this stuff to? No. No, no. Content browser. They change it to content browser instead of uh, visor. So inside of here, paint effects they have plant meshes and they have tree meshes so I could actually bring in a tree there wouldn't be an oak tree in the middle of my nightclub that would be ridiculous I would try to find something that looks appropriate like not a palm tree it's in New York it's in California though. no it isn't <laughs> we'll do a little, little maple tree okay so I click on it and then all I have to do is click and drag. There he is. That's pretty cool. That's all on Maya. That's all on Maya. 
Okay, so there's my tree. So now I'm like, cool, now I have a tree. Now again, I didn't model this. Um, I just had to drop it in. <clears throat> the stuff is gonna look pretty junky, like the leaves don't really look realistic. <laughs> right. No. <laughs> it looks okay, and I typically would use these as like a background element. Um, holy cow, it's taking a while. Oh, render man is my default. Let me hit escape. Close that. Discard. I don't know how render man does that. Maybe Dylan. I'll blame him. So there it is, mental ray. Okay. Now this is a paint effects tree. Paint effects is basically like. Oh, I guess it's not like anything else in any other program. Okay, it's basically like instancing. It's basically like a copy. It's basically like a script that runs on top of this. The mental ray won't show. So what I have to do to get it to show is I have to convert this into a polygon. So if I go to paint effects to polygons, right there, now I actually have polygon geometry that I could then render. And then I'll get it. So you can see it definitely doesn't look realistic. <laughs> the leaves. It looks like they have plastic on them. Right. And that's basically what they are. They're a plane that has been deformed, and there's a picture of a leaf on it. The transparency isn't showing through all the way, so that's why we're getting that. It looks like it's a plastic cut out tree. Yeah, it does. Wouldn't it work, though, if you delete the leaves and bring your own leaves in? Right. Well, I could just assign my own material to this. Because the reason that it looks horrible is because the leaf material is just a basic blin or a ramp shade or whatever they use. So you could just assign a brand new material to this, drop your own leaf texture on there, and it could look better. Okay. There's other tools also that you may want to investigate. So if you really wanted to have a nice looking tree, 3D frog. Can we model our own or you can model your own too. Um, I'm blanking on Thinkverse. No, it's not Thinkverse. Xfrog. There we go. Can't think of the name. <laughs> and I'll open it in Chrome. Maybe that'll open it better. What a world we live in. We have to have so many browsers. So Xfrog, you can actually download a trial of Xfrog and create stuff inside it. And it's basically like it builds stuff for you. So like you want to build a tree, so you drop in your tree template, you can control different features of it, and then export that out as a piece of geometry. And you get a whole bunch of models. So this is like the kind of stuff where I want to create a forest kind of thing. That's where you could do that. OK? Yeah, it's really cool. It's really simple to use. Um, other things you may want to investigate is Vine Generator. Maya. Okay, so let's say I'm doing something that's like, um, I don't know why people flock to this, but like end of the world kind of stuff. So this is a nightclub in New York, but the world has ended for the past 30 or 40 years, so we want to dilapidate the front of this building. So <clears throat> this is a, yeah. Right, when some, and to some point, yes. Uh, but like something like this, you would use for like, the end of the world stuff. Fallout. Yeah. So this is uh, a vine generator. And basically, it's, it's just like a brush. Like you paint it onto your geometry, and then it flows along your geometry to create these kinds of things. There you go. Stuff like that, stuff like that. Cool. And then there's also these other ones. This is another one. Don't be locked in on one, two. So if you, if you find that vine generator, that one looked like it was just vines or no leaves. Um, I believe this one, maybe it's this one. Nope, that's the same one. There was another one that I found that was a um, oh ivy generator. That's what it was. Could we do something like more of nature too? As I was thinking, like like the caves from Skyrim or something. You like could, yes. But I still want to have some hard surface objects in there. Well, that's what I mean. It'd be like set up with like furniture and stuff. It'd, yeah. It would just be like the home. Right, yeah, you could have this as your, you know, this is a cave, these are cave walls or whatever, and then you would still have openings and you would still have props and whatever else inside there.
So here, this is an Ivy generator. I've used this one before, and again, it's pretty easy of how they use um, some of these. Okay. And then here's some growing ones. Okay, lots of scripts, lots of plugins, lots of extra stuff out there. Don't rely on them to be like the end, like, well, that's what it looks like, so that's what I'm going to go with. Use it as a starting point. If the texture looks like junk, make a new texture. Okay, all the texture is grab a leaf, take a picture, cut it out in Photoshop. By this stage, most of you are nearing the graduation point. You should be able to go into Photoshop, cut something out, and just make an alpha channel and bring it back into Maya. We should be able to do that, okay? At least by the end of the semester. Even if you've never done it before, um, you should be able to work through the process. All right, so this is your first step is to go through and just lay out what you want your stuff to look like. Again, no major modeling at this stage. It's all just layout. What else do I want in the scene? Keep in mind our timeline. We have three weeks for this assignment. That's it, okay? Um, so we're going to be rendering this, um, we'll be rendering a little sweep of this, so obviously not as much as the other one, so just side to side. <clears throat> we'll have at least one object that we're bringing into ZBrush, most of the other items, um, hopefully it's working. We'll be taking into Mari, and we'll be able to use Mari on those, so my trash can I don't want to use just a shiny metal and call it a shiny metal trash can. I want it to look like an actual trash can. Okay, my bench that's over here, I want it to look like a bench. So as I model stuff in the bench, I'm going to model it like it should have. So I'm going to model the individual pieces of it. So when I look at a bench, that's a truck. I told my kids, <clears throat> we were uh, vehicle shopping at one point, and we were like, oh, we can get a kidnapping van. <laughs> Like, what's a kidnapping van? I'm like, look, you can put the kids in the back and nobody can get out and nobody can hear them scream. Like, what? <laughs> That's a real thing. It is, apparently. <laughs> nobody wants to sit down. Look at that. Oh my god, all that garbage. Yeah, it's all blocked off. Um, let's go back. What the heck? I know. This is really advanced. So, uh, do you want us to do like an outdoor scene or it doesn't matter? It doesn't matter. An outdoor scene is easier than an indoor scene. As far as like the details you can put in there. I could, yes. <laughs> you don't have to put trees or plants though in an indoor scene unless you absolutely have to. Right, so something like this is nice if we're doing something that is nice and clean. There's no story though with a bench like this. You know, it's just like there's a bench. But if we look at something like this, there's a bit more story to it than the other one. You can see the rotting that's happening on the side here. You can see the discoloration that's on there. Okay, like I said, it doesn't have to be like the end of the world kind of stuff, but there still is life typically in most items that are around. This is kind of neat too, right? Like if you did a backyard scene and you want to have like, here's a garden, a lot of floral stuff, so I, I would avoid that. Uh, but you can see there's still like some life left in that uh, bench there. Street rotten. That's not what I wanted to type in. <laughs> I get Sesame Street, 21 Jump Street. See, even like this, it's kind of neat how they have this here. Here's alleys. Right, because we only have three weeks, we have to keep it pretty small, right? So you could even do like an alleyway, right? So you have an alley and you'd have the back of buildings. You'd have like the ACs. Oops, go back a bit. Have you seen that bit in, I forgot what the city is called, the walled city, something they tore down. It was in China, I think it was like a, a walled Forbidden city. Kingdom? They tore it down in, I think, the 80s. It was just like a box. That's a movie. People like... <laughs> The population was just cr was just insane. Like the amount of people that were crammed into this small area, but like they're doing like I think they're doing a video game that takes place inside of it. Right, it just looks really cool just because of the everything's just built right on top of each other, so it's just like labyrinths of stuff. Right. 
But no, it looked really cool. They ended up, yeah, it like it tore it down in like the 80s or something. Yeah, so even like stuff like this, like there's wires. <clears throat> Look at all the wires and, and boxes and poles and pipes and everything else that's just kind of connecting all of these things. So all that kind of stuff you can add into your scene. It's just a matter of making it fit and be appropriate and still telling that same story. Okay, so every time you add something to the scene, it should tell a story about what that stuff is. Like this bench here, I'm actually gonna get rid of because this is New York, nobody wants to sit, nobody's gonna let you sit on a bench outside their club, right? This is gonna be something else. It'll be a vending machine or it'll be an ATM or something, right? So if it's an ATM, obviously it's gonna be a bit bigger. There you go. So now it's an ATM. And then also keep in mind your scale. So your scale is very important because look at how big the doorway is. That's a normal human walking through that. Now look at my ATM. What ATM is that big? I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> I've been it that big? Like that big? I'm a short guy. It's, like it's huge. <laughs> right. Like this big. There you go. And even my garbage can thing, like this is too big too. That's got to come down. So you always got to keep in mind that scale because the scale is going to be very important to um, how you set up this scene. Okay, so once you have this in mind, your next step is going to be to do the lighting. Lighting happens much quicker if you don't have a whole bunch of geometry and a whole bunch of textures and a whole bunch of other stuff. So for lighting, just keep in mind what your scene is. Is it at night? Is it during the day? What's going on with it? Where is your light coming from? So for a scene like this, um, and for this one I think I'm actually play around with V-Ray a little bit just to see uh, how much I can create. So let's say I made a sphere light in here. Now if you use something like V-Ray or RenderMan, we have it installed here and we can use it here, but you probably don't have V-Ray at home. So I'm going to switch this to V-Ray. RenderMan you could get at home. You could actually download uh, RenderMan for free and use that if you'd like. So the lighting from this, I want it to seem like it's um, street lights, right? So for in New York, these are street lights that are just kind of like illuminating that. And just by adding in those three lights, I'm getting that illusion. It's kind of hard to see on the screen up there. Um, intensity multiplier, let's go 40, 40. I'm also going to look at the color because if my color, uh, nope, rendering, window, V-Ray render buffer, there we go. So if my lights are white, that's not going to come off as convincing for a night scene. A night light is never white, right? Like a street lamp nope <laughs> like you'll see these ones are kind of like bluish tinted and then these ones are more in the orangey spectrum right so I may want to add that into my scene too and I can do that two ways if you're using something like V-Ray <clears throat> I can use the color mode change the temperature or change the color Um, I could also, uh, once I change this temperature, then I have to lower this. Dang it. I always do it. Let me render this to the Maya one. B, show your render buffer. There we go. And then one of these buttons here. Nope. and then click the teapot there we go alright so there's my other view right so there's with me changing the temperature of the lights changing the color of the lights to something that's a little bit more light colored now with looking at this I may look at that and say well I don't like all the lights being this color I want to add in some complementary lights something else that's going to contrast so if I have my sign way over here, my sign could be a neon sign. And that neon sign could glow and give a different color um, to the scene. 
So then I could create just another light. And like I said, I'm playing with the V-Ray stuff, so I'm just grabbing just a V-Ray light. And I'm just kind of sizing this. If you're using mental ray, it's the same kind of light setup that you would do in the other scene. I'll go to temperature for this. I'll make it a little bit bluer. I'll save this image. I'll render the next image. And so now you can see how I'm introducing, unlike this green, I'm not sure if that's going to go away. We'll find out. But I like how this is, you know, blue here, and then I got the orangey yellow light coming in from my street lights. Yes, ma'am. So if you were to, like, actually make, like, a neon sign, and you went into, I'm guessing, like, Illustrator, and then you, like, said we'll bust out some letters, how would you make those go up? <clears throat> in Maya 2016 extension 2, mm -hmm. they redid their type tool. So if I go here to type, I'll get a brand new interface. So on yours, you won't get that because you have basically like it just creates type. But on here, we'll get this where I could type in what? Let's try this again. Click there, type. I'm not sure who Mark is, but it seems like a good name for a club. So let's say this is Mark's Club. Um, I have a bunch of tools here where I can change the font, I can change my tracking, I can change my kerning, I can change the letting if there was extra lines, um, change the space width, there's no extra space width, there's a type manipulator you can play with. And then I can go to Extrude, and I can play with different kinds of extrudes that'll create this. So if I'm trying to do something that looks like Neon signs is basically like the tubes, right, that would be created. So with this, I can tweak this and see if I can get something to show up. I open my bevel, label font bevel. There you go. So you can see how that's kind of changing that. Um, well, I don't think I'm going to be able to find one that's going to be like that for this. All right. Well, if I wanted just this, that's how I would do this one. Okay. So let's say I wanted the other one, which is more of like tubes. Go back to my type. Um, where is it at? There it is. I'm going to convert this to create curve from type. And so now if I look inside here, what? Come on. Type. There it is. So now I have these. <clears throat> so then to create the, um, I'm going to try one thing and then we'll see if it works as good as I think it's going to. So I'm going to create a circle, I'm going to shift click this, and then under surfaces I'm going to go to extrude. So this extrude is not the same as a polygon extrude. This is going to take that circle that I just created, which is right here, and it's going to extrude it along this path. So it should create like a tube like a neon light would have. The only options you need to change are these four right ones. You just check all these and then converting it to polygons. I always make this a quad count, or sorry, quad general, and then change this to the bottom one, which is per span, per span. Okay, so that creates the three using this circle. Now the problem is that the, the circle is huge, so it's basically just like extruding it along there. So I just shrink this down, and then we have that three that is basically just a tube that goes around it, okay? Now you could do the same thing in Illustrator. If you were to draw something in Illustrator, 
You could draw whatever you want inside Illustrator. So if you wanted to create your type inside there, create a nice scripty font that would then be brought in. Well, I was just wondering how you get something like that to glow. Oh, to glow? Give it its own light. <clears throat> boom, boom, boom. Let me get the Illustrator, uh, show that real quick, and then we'll get back to that one. Okay. All right, so I just make any document inside Illustrator. You draw, you type, you do whatever you need to inside here. Let's make that huge. Pick a font. And you can pick fonts inside of Maya too. I'm going to go with something kind of simple. There you go, something like that. All right. So I'm going to do this just with one letter. Uh, but I can do uh, create outlines under text, wrong button. All right, so now each of these is an outline. And I can scoot these over so they're intersecting each other. Like that. And then I can grab all of these, use the pathfinder. And then just merge this all into one shape and then invert it and there we go okay so now I have marks written out so then I'm gonna save this now here's the trick it has to be curves or paths inside of Illustrator we have to make sure that we have some sort of path it doesn't understand fonts it doesn't understand gradients it just understands paths so I'm gonna save this into my folder work And I'll call this marks. And then when we save it, we have to save it as Illustrator 8. All the other stuff here, it doesn't read. So if we save it as anything else except for Illustrator 8, it just won't come in. Yes. So now when we come into Maya, we go to create, and you'll see it says Illustrator object is actually a thing. So there's my Illustrator file. Okay, so there it is. And then I can do essentially the same thing. So I can use that same circle, shift click this, and then go to surfaces, extrude, these four, polygon, quads, general, purse band, purse band, extrude. If it goes too crazy, that's because I have um, these corners here are just too tight and it just doesn't know how to interpret it. So I may have to either soften it by doing stuff like this or going back to Illustrator and just softening that transition there. Did you delete those? Yeah, I'm just deleting them. Okay. Now I can delete all of them except for the start. I'm not sure where the start is in this one. Mario's still crashing, by the way. Is it? Here it is. So if I start deleting this one, it'll actually open it up so I don't delete that one. Okay, so the same thing, I would just go through, tweak it, whatever. So that's how you can bring stuff from Illustrator. So now let's delete this. I don't need that anymore. I'm going to delete my history on this piece. And let's say that for whatever reason we wanted this three to glow right in front of our window. And I'm going to delete that, I'm going to delete this, I'm going to delete that. So under create lights, there's a couple things. Uh, one of them is an object light, <clears throat> which is right here. Um, this is for mental ray though. So if I'm using mental ray, I can just click the object, hit object light, and there we go. For V-ray, um, I believe, remember where that was, create lights. Sphere, dome, rectangle, I guess. Sometimes it's under assigning a new material and on the material itself. There it is, V-Ray Light. And then so we can test it, I'll make this like purple.
And that didn't work. <laughs> v ray material, V ray, that. Let me see my rendering menu. Let me see. There we go. Um, so I went to the wrong spot. <laughs> so create V-Ray mesh lights, turn selection into lights. So now that should work. We'll find out. So I'll save my image, hit the render button again. There we go. So now this light is at, or this number is actually emitting light. Um, the material on it that I chose is what's causing it to be black, but any glow that I would have from this, I would actually want to do inside of uh, Nuke, okay, or inside a post, inside of Photoshop, something else. Um, if I try to do that inside here, um, it's going to glow, but it's not going to look like a good glow. It's going to look like a really fake looking glow. So this is almost done, 92, 93. And then as you're doing this kind of stuff, that's where you'll also figure out, like, I want to create this and not have it look like that, because that looks pretty junky. So I have to figure out how to make this three glow. Now I know it's going to be something turning some sort of glow on. At the very least, it's going to be faking it. It's going to be basically cranking up. Yeah, that doesn't look good. Uh, cranking up some sort of material. So if I go into my Maya, I go into my surface shader, and I make this white here. Turn that on. Well, it still doesn't want to glow. It's white, yes. Texture, sure. Let me assign the default material to this. What are you doing? Are you using the glow material? I was using the light material. Oh, the light material. Okay. Let me make a different object. I like a three. You should turn the transparent to be the Brand low area lights on it, so it might light up. I could, side. but that shouldn't. I should be able to just create it and say you're glowing. Oops. Let me just take this, make a V-ray lights, turn selection into lights. That should be it. Whoops. No, I am using V-Ray Render. This is the V-Ray Renderer here. Like you said, most people wouldn't have it. Like you wouldn't have it at home. You wouldn't have V-Ray at home, right. But here you would have it. So, since it's here, it's actually included in Maya? No, we bought it as a separate thing. Is it like a plug yeah, no. it's a separate plugin. Okay, I thought it was a separate thing. Yeah, so I'll have to look that up and see what the stuff is. I'm still newer to V-Ray. Uh, but most of the things are the same. Like if I went to Mental Ray, my other lights aren't going to work. Is V Ray better than Mental Ray? <clears throat> um, v Ray is easier to use than Mental Ray, but the problem is like Mental Ray is free. You have it, and V Ray obviously is not free. Um, Maya service. All right, so here it is in Mental Ray. This thing is white, super duper white. So what I could do is I could turn on things like uh, quality. Yes, there it is. I could turn on um, Final Gather. And what Final Gather does is it glows. 
right? It takes your light source or your objects that are bright, and then it emits light from them. So right here, this is actually emitting light. If I zoom out a smidge, And let me create another light in the scene. That's a regular mental ray light. So if I'm using mental ray, I would just create a regular uh, point light. There you go, and you can kind of see it glowing. <clears throat> I'm gonna take the point light's intensity down some. I'm gonna give it a color. There you go. So now you can definitely see that this light is actually glowing and illuminating that surface. And the brighter I make that surface shader, so right now the intensity is at 1, the, the value is at 1. If I made that 10, even though we can't scroll up that high, it'll actually make that 10 times brighter. So now you can see that this actually looks like it's illuminating off there. Now there's no glow coming off the light. The glow is what I would do inside of Nuke or inside of Photoshop. Okay, and we'll get into customizing that kind of stuff after too. Um, so that's how we would do stuff like neon. We would take our word and we would, there's my word. I should still have my surface shader. There we go. Now it's super glowy. <laughs> All right. So if I'm going to use mental ray or V ray or whatever, that's the kind of stuff we're kind of deciding at this point. So if we get to this point where we're that is my tree. Um, where we're trying to figure out what you know renderer we want to use. Maybe we want to use V-Ray, play around with that. Maybe we want to use uh, Mental Ray and play around with it. <clears throat> this will be the stage where we would figure that stuff out. If you get a decent render from V-Ray or Mental Ray at this stage, like besides my big sphere that's hanging out here and the green that's right there, the coloring in here actually looks pretty nice. Like I like the way it's darker on the screen up here. But I like the way that it's coming out. Uh, one of these buttons. This one? Nope. There it is. One of these allows me to see it. I'm not sure why it's not showing. It allows me to adjust my color so you guys can see it better. Um, but the coloring on here is actually pretty nice, so I would probably stick with V-Ray for this. Now I have to keep in mind the limitation. I have to keep in mind that every time I want to render this, I have to come to V-Ray. But what it also means is that I, if I like it, it's good. I can just stay with it like this. All of my texturing, my modeling, everything else, doesn't matter. Because once I get my model built, that's for either platform, Mental Ray or Maya or uh, V-Ray or anything. Once I get my texture, that'll go across any platform. Once I get any of my stuff, it'll go across any platform. I just have to know that my final rendering and shaders are all going to be done inside of V-Ray, so they have to be done here. So if you can't come here during labs, or you can't come here um, to render your stuff out when you need to, don't go with V-Ray. If you want to play with RenderMan, that's also a nice uh, renderer. If you have 2017 you want to use Arnold, you can. You can't render out uh, videos with it though, right? So you can only render out a single frame, otherwise you get a watermark on all of them. There is a workaround. Where is it? So there's a script that someone came up with. So this is a viewport batch render. So if you have Arnold and you want to render it out in animation, you could use this script and it'll go through and render out in your viewport frame one and save it. Then render out frame two and then render out frame three. Oh, I see. So it kind of just 
cheats it. It cheats it. It does it one, one, <laughs> one frame, frame at a time. time. Right. Time. The only bad thing is I've used it. It pretty much it locks up your station until it's done. Still usable. Still awesome. Uh, if you want to play with it. Um, is that really easy? It's incredibly easy. It's literally just like you add a light. It looks like this one pretty much was. I added a light and changed the color, and it's it's reacting the way that it should be reacting inside my viewport. You know, the only thing I have to fix on these, obviously, is I don't want them to be glowing uh, in my scene, and then this, I obviously don't want that to be green, which is weird. It might just be where it's hitting it. I'm not sure yet. Okay. So this class that we're doing, this this assignment, is all about the environment. It's all about creating the best image. I'll show you just another cool thing with V-Ray. We were playing around with it the other night just because I've used it before, like years ago, but because we, um, because Mentoray was free, I never really dedicated much time to it. So there's a plane, um, create V-Ray for, <laughs> and then I can just shrink that down. Yeah, so now I have grass in the middle of the street for some reason. New York. Right. They're actually tubes. There's tube worms. <laughs> and then I can go in and shrink my thickness, 0 0.05. Sure. I could adjust my tapering. I could adjust my bend. What was that? This is under furry property. This is under create V ray whoops. V ray fur add to mesh. What if you want to do for mental ray? Can you do it? Mental ray has other stuff. You'd have to use XGen for mental ray. And then for this I would assign a new material under V ray hair. And then I would choose a green color. And I can see I have like scraggly grass. And then I can go to my fur properties and say I want per area. Whoops, that's too much. Funny. I'm in too many programs today. There we go. So now we have like actual grass that's on there. Now the downside is the grass doesn't move. Um, also, I have very little selection or um, ability to move the grass around. Like if I wanted certain grass to be in certain spots and not other spots, I'm kind of limited as to what I can do with this thing because the V-Ray grass kind of sucks. It's very cool. It created it really quickly, but there's not a whole lot I can do with it after I created it. Now there are workarounds. I could take this and make this, let's say, per face, uh, let's say one. And let's say I took the plane and I made this like that. Then I could shrink this plane down and just move this wherever I want. Right? So if I wanted just grass over here, let's say I have cracks in my sidewalk, which eventually I'll have cracks in the sidewalk. And then I can also go through, let's see, level of detail. No, oh, variance, that's what I want length variance and I can crank up that and now I just have these like shoots of grass kind of coming out the middle so if I had cracks in my ground which eventually I will then I can add these little grass things in here just to make it look like there's some grass growing up in the, the cracks of the sidewalk Okay, so a lot of it's going to be having to work around it, but that's getting ahead of, of what we're doing. So the first part, create your layout, then add your lights. Once you've created your layout like this, you've added your lights, then it's simply going to be a matter of going through and modeling, texturing, and modeling, and texturing, modeling, and texturing every single item in your scene. So stuff like this, I want to go through and actually model what a cone looks like. I want to go through and model what one of these look like. Eventually I would delete all of this stuff, I would delete all of these, I would model a single one, I would texture a single one, I'd get this single cone to look exactly like I want it to look, 
and then I would duplicate it and scoot it over and then start adjusting stuff, okay? Same thing with my sidewalk. I'd make sure that my sidewalk was what I wanted it to be, okay? What you don't want to happen, what always happens is people don't plan their stuff out and then they realize I need my sidewalk to be this much bigger or this much smaller or I need a little bit more room here or there because you just didn't plan your stuff out. Or I made a window and don't use booleans. We talked about booleans. Don't use booleans. But just for fun, here's a uh, difference. See how horrible it is? There it goes. People make boolean stuff, and then it's like, well, see, look at it. I can't even see through this. Why wouldn't it let me see through it? There we go. So now we have this big hole in our window, and then people are like, well, I don't know what to do with this big hole in the window. What should I put back here? Like, well, you got to think about that stuff ahead of time. You got to think about what you're doing with it. And if you can't think of something to put in that window, then don't put a window. Put something else. Put it blocked up. Put curtains in front of it. Figure out some way to do it. Okay? So once you're done working on your other assignment, oops, keep that there. Then you can start building this kind of stuff. Like I said, we have three weeks. My lectures from here on, um, I'm gonna provide some just on Canvas, okay? So it's basically gonna be me watching TV shows on one screen and then me speed recording without any audio in the other screen of what I'm doing, okay? In class, I'm gonna go over different tools. All the tools that I would use to model stuff, I've already gone over, I've already shown you them. There's only a certain set of tools that I would ever use to model anything. Insert edge loop, I showed how to use insert edge loop before. Multi-cut, I've shown how to use multi-cut. Um, and then extruding and then beveling and then bridge. Those are typically like the five tools I use for every single thing that I'm modeling. Maybe not bridge, but everything else. I'm typically using those four or five tools for everything that I model. And you can pretty much model any item just using those tools. And you can get away with a lot of it without even using that. I could model this whole cone with just using insert edge loops and just scaling stuff up and moving stuff. That's all I would have to do. Same thing with any of this kind of thing here. And when you model anything, look up reference for it. Don't eyeball it, don't guess, don't try to, try to fake it out. What does a uh, vinyl rope look like? Not that. <laughs> it's not velvet. It's, vel it's uh, not vinyl. It's velvet. There we go. Okay. You can see how they have like these ones that have a little loop around it. Or there's this one. What kind of nightclub is this? Oh, those ones are kind of cool. There you go. And if you don't have Maya at home, do all your reference at home. Do all your research at home. If you make a Pinterest board, you can make a Pinterest board for your environment assignment. And when you're sitting on the potty, you can look up all these pictures of stuff for your room and then you can Pinterest it all and save it. So when you get onto the computer, you have it all saved, ready to go. Okay, so look up reference for everything that you're doing and use the reference to model your stuff. So we're making a video, not an image? We're making images, I meant to say images, um, from different angles. So we're gonna shoot it from like, you know, something like this, something like that. We'll have like three images, I'm thinking. That should be good enough um, that we can populate the stuff with. And then we'll also be taking some of our items into a game environment so you can see the process of taking your stuff from 3D into an actual game and then re-putting it in the scene and making it in, um, interactive, okay? All right. So